Okay, so this is part four of my teaching about the church in Laodicea. And at first I, I just thought I'd do one, you know, then it became two and three. And I've got one more, so it's going to end up being a five-part series on this little passage from the scripture that we know so well. I'm going to start by reading it, and then I'm going to expand it. If you haven't got notes in front of you, there's a few spare kicking around. Uh, is there anyone who wants a set of notes? Just put your hand up and we can get one to you. Okay. So the angel of the church in Laodicea writes, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I'm rich, I've acquired wealth, I do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich. And white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom you, I love are rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. And I'll stop there. <clears throat> we know the next bit, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. So today I'm focusing on the one phrase, um, buy from me white clothes so that you can cover your shameful nakedness. Now what does it mean to be naked? I want to tell you a story of a guy called Dave. And Dave was a middle-aged guy. He always wanted to be a musician but never learnt anything. And so he was always going on about, yeah, I'm going to be a musician one day. And one year his wife bought him one of them, you know, them little Casio keyboards like yeah. this for 20 quid from a charity shop or whatever it was and he spent all his Christmas holiday practicing and he got really good you know it's twinkle twinkle yeah. Yeah. little star and he learned how to press the buttons get the drums playing and he could do it with his other finger on his left hand and he he learned three or four tunes and he really thought he was getting good and uh, you know he went back to work and he was telling all his colleagues at work how great he was Anyway, he kept, kept on practicing, and a month or two later, they had to go from his office down to a works conference at the Albert Hall in, in uh, London. And, you know, they were queuing to get in, and there were people from all over the country. It was a huge affair, thousands of people there. And uh, he was just joking with some of his mates from the office. You know, I oh, learned this amazing tune last night. I'm going to give a con concert very soon, he said. The, his friends had started calling him Dave the Musician because he kept going on and on about his keyboard, you know. It's like, oh, Dave the Musician in concert, so amazing, we're looking forward to it. And one of the ushers overheard what they were saying. And he came up to Dave and he goes, oh, are you Dave? And Dave goes, yeah. So he said, oh, just come with me a minute. So he, the usher took him off. Dave said, I have no idea what this is, but he followed him. And he was taken into this little room round the back and there were two other people in there. And he thought, this is strange, you wonder who these are. So he started talking to these two people. And one was a famous folk singer who had performed all over the world, you know, Sydney Opera House, Carnegie Hall, all of this. And he had his guitar there and he thought, strange. The other one was a, a, a concert pianist. And then there was Dave. And anyway, they were talking, and the usher came back again, and he took this folk singer off. He said, it's your turn now, come. And so the folk singer went off. And on a screen in the room, he, Dave saw this guy that he'd just been talking to appear on the stage, and everyone was clapping, and he performed this amazing song, and the crowd went wild. And then the usher came back, and the concert pianist, he was taken off onto this stage and they thought, this is, this is really weird, you know, I have no idea why I'm here. And the concert pianist performed all this Beethoven 
piano concerto and it just blew everybody away. And then the usher comes back and he goes, Dave, Dave the musician, come, it's your turn. And Dave goes, oh, um, what is this? Anyway, he followed. And suddenly he found himself on this stage in front of thousands of people in this hall. And there'd just been these two other amazing musical acts and the usher had heard the talk about Dave the musician giving a concert. And he'd mixed him up with another person who had yet to arrive. And Dave was stood there thinking, well, I know, I think I'm good at bar bar black sheep, but I'm not sure it's really going to cut it with this audience. Being naked means that who you really are is exposed for everybody to see. Now I want to give you another picture. Imagine you find yourself waiting in a line. There's a couple of other people there. One is Chinese looking guy, the other is African. And you go through this door together and you're in this huge arena like the Colosseum. People all up on the bleachers. And in the middle is this big white throne. And somehow you just know that Jesus is sitting there. And in the bleachers, it's the great crowd of witnesses all watching. And this Chinese guy goes up first to Jesus. And um, he just falls at Jesus' feet. And he starts thanking him over and over how Jesus saved him and how he helped him. And then he started talking about how Jesus had been with him in his life and he was telling different scenes. He was saying, you know, Jesus, I'm, I'm so grateful. Even when the guards came to my house and they took me away from my wife and children, you helped me to testify boldly for you. And you gave me such peace when they were beating me. And you sustained me all through those terrible years in prison when I was so often tortured, even giving me great joy when I was by myself in my cell. And you helped me to remain faithful when they questioned me and they just said, stop talking about Jesus and then you can go back to your wife and children. But you just helped me all the time. Stay faithful to you. And then when I was released, you gave me courage to keep going out and preaching your gospel. And Jesus, I'm so thankful for all that you've done for me. And then the African guy went forward and the same, he fell at Jesus' feet and was thanking and praising and then he started telling about his life and he said Jesus I just want to thank you for the privilege you you gave me you called me to be a pastor and even though it meant that I had to give up my prestigious job in the university that paid really well and gave me this lovely house and I ended up living in a tiny little house because the church had no money to pay me and you know, as a pastor, I worked hard day and night, and I didn't have the recognition that I had in the university. People were against me, but God, you always strengthened me. And even though we never had much, you always made sure that we had bread to eat. And when we were so busy, people coming day and night, you always gave me strength. And you blessed my family, Lord. We didn't have much to give the kids. We had to borrow clothes from other people. But Lord, my life has just been so fantastic and all my family are following you today. And I just thank you for this life that you've given me. And then you know it's your turn. And you look up and you see in the bleachers, you know, the great crowd of witnesses. And you know that many of those people have given their all for Jesus, been martyred, <coughs> been persecuted, laid aside careers, you know, given up money, all sorts of things. And you've heard the ones that go before you and you, you think of your own life. You think of this nice, comfortable life that you have. Yes, you go to church most Sundays, you, you complain if the worship's a bit too loud and the preacher goes a bit long. And, but you try to be a nice Christian. 
you smile at people at work and you don't really talk about Jesus because they might not like you if you did that you're going through your life you think well what can I say I mean I can't think of anyone I ever led to faith and can't even think of any great sacrifice that I ever made for Jesus really I put some money in the offering not a lot but some I never prayed a lot didn't read my Bible much to be honest I found Netflix more exciting than what am I going to say on that day Jesus says to the church in Laodicea you are pitiful wretched, poor, blind and naked and do you know it's much better to hear Jesus say those words to you now than on that day which will surely come before any of us are ready probably before we expect and we'll be standing there before the great crowd of witnesses who have done so much for him and what are we going to say are we going to be found on that day naked Jesus says I ask you I counsel you buy from me white clothes so that you can hide your shameful nakedness now then I've just got a few things to say five different things about white clothes what white clothes talk about they talk about how you've lived your life so the five things are the, the forgiveness we can have from God the second is our holy living our identity third and fourth about a wedding and the last one about our ministry but before we get to that I just want to try and get us to change our thinking because do you know the church in the west we bank on the grace of God in a wrong way we just think that God will forgive us and we believe that he died on the cross so everything's going to be fine for us it doesn't really matter that I don't do a lot for God because I'm saved hallelujah we've been singing you know washed in the blood of the lamb and there's power in the blood as long as I come to church and believe that I'll be fine on that day but actually the Bible says something really different uh, you're saved by faith you can't be saved you can't go to heaven by doing good things so I think we all know that but Jesus said you will know a tree by his fruit and there are many passages and I've put them down there in the points 2 D E and F and, and on that um, even though you're saved by faith God is going to examine you as a Christian believer and he's going to judge you according to what you've done and that's why he said to the church it wasn't to the non-Christians it was to the church in Laodicea unless you change you're going to be found naked you're going to be so ashamed of how you've lived your life on that day in front of all the saints you know you, you'll be naked in front of all these other people who've got all these amazing white clothes what we do for God now determines the reward that we get later in heaven and I talked a little bit about that last week and there's a few verses there um, that, that state it very clearly God rewards us according to what we have done and so don't think that you're going to go all through your Christian life just coming to church once a week reading your Bible a little bit once in a while not really doing anything for God then you're going to get some amazing crown of glory in heaven because it's not going to be like that yes you'll be saved Paul talks about those who are saved as if through fire and I talked about that last time but God is offering you something different a different eternity but also a different uh, present in this life he's offering you white clothes now if you've missed any of the past ones I did I talked a bit more about this last time they're all on the King's Church YouTube site and you can go and listen to them catch up on there 
So let's think about white clothes. First of all, white clothes signify forgiveness. And this is the most simple level. And I guess we all get this. You know, your clothes are white. They're not stains. They're being washed. And we've all heard, I'm sure, that Jesus died on the cross to forgive your sin. And he offers you that complete new start. And if you haven't experienced that in your life, I really strongly encourage you to give your life to Jesus and ask him to forgive you. There's no sin that you've committed, nothing that you've done that is too dark, no stain that is too deep, that Jesus can't completely forgive you from it and wash you white as snow. There's a, a beautiful picture in the Bible in Zechariah of the priest of God, Joshua, who was standing before the Lord and he was dressed in these filthy clothes. And the filth represents really who he was and all that he'd done before God. And unless we give our life to Jesus and ask for that forgiveness, that's how it will be. On that day, we'll be standing in these filthy clothes before God. In the vision there in Zechariah chapter 3, God gives him beautiful new white clothes and he can stand before God with dignity and with cleansing. Point four, white clothes also talk about our holy living. So Jesus gives us a white robe, but he expects us to keep it clean. And my mum tells this story, you know, in the old days when she was a girl, she grew up in, um, on the outskirts of Manchester and a lot of her family worked in the cotton mills. There are all the cotton mills there and all sort of working class people. They weren't that rich. And all the aunts and uncles lived in the next street and worked in the next mill and all that sort of thing. And she said every Whitson, her mum would make her and her two sisters a new dress. And I mean, that you didn't get like new clothes whenever you went down to Asda in those days. It was like once a year, specially made, bought the material and, you know, sewed it up and tried it on and all. And it was like a special thing. And then at Whitson, you had to go as a little girl and uh, show how beautiful you were you to your aunts and uncles. You know, you were taken on Whitson to all the relatives so they could see how fantastic you looked. And, um, you know, this Whitson, she'd put on a new dress. And she, before they'd gone on the bus to see Auntie so-and-so, she'd sneaked out the back door to play with her mates. And one of them had got some new go-kart and they were towing up and down the street. And she wanted to go, so she sat on it. And her new dress got caught in the wheel. And it, it rubbed a, a hole in the dress and it was all dirty. You know, so she got this new dress, but she had to go around the relatives with dirt and a hole. And Jesus, he, he gives you a completely new start. He forgives your sin, washes you clean. We have the choice of staying like that. And you know, every day we have a choice, don't we, of what clothes that we put on for Ladies, it seems to be a bigger choice than for men. I think they take a little bit longer choosing what they put on. For me, it's easy. When I find some clothes I like, you know, like these trousers, I buy four pairs and I don't need to shop for another two years. <laughs> and the same with the top, okay? I've got four different colours, but it's the same one. So I won't need to go clothes shopping until 2025. But, um, do you know, in the morning, you can, you can choose what you put on. And um, point 4b, it, it says this, uh, from the book of Colossians, Therefore, as God's chosen people, clothe yourself with compassion, with kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If anyone has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together. And so, do you know when you go out, like my mum went out into the 
yard to play. We go out into the world, don't we? And we meet dirty, difficult situations. And in those situations, we can choose if we're going to put on anger or forgiveness. If we're going to put on a critical spirit or gentleness, forgiving, we can choose in all those different situations what clothes we put on. And it's interesting, Paul says, put them on. So, and that, you know, for most of us, at the stage of our Christian life, it's a choice. We're not so holy that when we meet someone who's horrible to us, we just love them and forgive them. We're growing into that. We'll come to that in a minute. But it's the choice that when we are in these situations, we have to put on these Christian attributes. And that's one of the great things. You know, Jesus says, I counsel you to buy from me white clothes. Now, we were talking the other week about buying, that we have to pay something. It costs, doesn't it? If someone's horrible to you, to love them and to forgive them, it's a costly thing to do. But Jesus goes, if, if you want, if you pay the price, I will give you white clothes. So you don't have to wear these dirty old clothes of hatred and bitterness and jealousy and complaining and all the, the, the things that are out in the dark world. You can live among people in a different way. You can live like Jesus. And the white clothes, they actually talk about your new identity. Point five, you know, in the ancient world, clothes told you a lot more about people than they do today. Because today you can go to Asda or you can go to the charity shop. And for just a few pounds, you can buy the clothes that the rich people wear. And so, you, you know, you look and you can't really tell the difference these days between rich and poor because we all wear similar clothes, you know. But in the old days, you could really tell the difference between the rich and the poor because the poor just wore basic functional clothes made out of whatever materials were there, wool, linen, flax, whatever. Whereas the rich, they had money to spare. And some of the, you know, the Roman togas, those purple togas, do you know, to get the purple to dye one toga, it took 14,000 sea snails and each one had to be crushed with a stone and a tiny little bit of purple came out there. 14,000, imagine the time to collect those and to crush them all and collect the purple and you just got one token. So poor people couldn't afford clothes like that. And so you could look at someone and you could tell their status in life by the clothes that they were wearing. And, um, you know, Jesus says, come to me, buy from me white clothes. Now, what I love about that is whenever people saw Jesus in the Bible, in the Old Testament, you know, Joshua, the man, uh, the commander of the army of the Lord before Jericho, or these different times when he went on the Mount of Transfiguration, he was changed before his disciples and his clothes were shining whiter than the sun, it says. Jesus appears in these white robes. And he offers to give us the same identity that he has himself. Philippians 2.5b, it says this, that we're called to become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation so that you will shine like the stars in the sky. Jesus wants you to live shining, like these white shining clothes that Jesus had that were supernatural. He wants you to live in a warped and crooked generation, so clothed in pure sparkling white with your attitude, you know, that people look at that amazed. That's, that's the clothes that he's offering. He's offering, you can live like that if you want. That is who you're called to be. And the white robes, it doesn't just talk about living 
a good Christian life morally, you know, not lying, not complaining, not grumbling. It actually talks about us changing so that we become like Jesus. Jesus was called the light of the world. We're called to be the light of the world. Jesus was called the shepherd, the good shepherd. We're called to be the shepherds of God's people. And all the things that Jesus was, you can look at them one by one. The scripture also says that we're called to be like that. We're called to be as Jesus was in the world. And we're called to do the things that Jesus did, even the miracles, the caring for the poor, the making disciples, all of that. That's what we're called to do and to be. But it's a little bit like, again, in the old days, you know, when um, you probably got a lot more hand-me-downs in those days. And you'd have a little brother who would, um, you know, get the trousers that you could look at, the, the sort of, the bottom four inches were sewn up because he wasn't quite tall enough and he always wore it with a big belt and they were very big round here because he was growing into his new clothes. Do you know, Jesus gives us these clothes that we have to grow into. He gives us his clothes, his ministry. He goes, yes, I was a shepherd. Yes, I was a preacher. Yes, I was a pastor. But I'm calling you to do this. And you put on these clothes and you think, that's not really what I am underneath. And that's one point of clothes, isn't it? They cover your shameful nakedness. You know, you put the clothes on and you, you feel like you're a king. And Jesus gives us these clothes and he goes, I'm calling you to be like me. That is actually who you are. That is the identity I'm offering you. These are your clothes. And it's a choice if we grow into them and make them our clothes or if we stay like a small naked person who thinks they're borrowing the clothes. You know, that is who God has called you to be. We've got to grow into our clothes. We've got to see ourselves differently. Point six, white clothes talk about the wedding. Now, I love this. It was great when we had Jenny and Gary's wedding. Wasn't that great? What a lovely wedding. And didn't Jenny look amazing in her wonderful white dress? Now, I've not talked to Jenny where she got it from or yeah. how it was made. Uh, perhaps later we can have the story of that. But, um, you know, one of the most important verses about white clothes in the, in the Bible, uh, point, point 6a there, it says, The wedding of the Lamb has come, and the bride has made herself ready. Then it goes on to say, Fine linen bright and clean was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's people. Now that is really important, that verse. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's people. So in the Bible, both men and women are called the bride of Christ. Now, it's not a male and female thing, you know, Jesus is a man and only the women can be the bride of Christ. It's God and humanity. And it's like a picture that we can't quite get our heads around until we get to heaven. But we are the bride of Christ. We're, humans and God will come together in one. You know, we'll be married one day. And the book of Revelation describes in great detail the, 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 the marriage. Many prophecies look forward to that. So, the fine linen, that's the righteous acts of the saints. That's what we do on earth. So, let me just ask you a question. Who sorts out the wedding dress? Is it the husband or is it the bride? It's not the husband, is it? No. You know, Gary hadn't seen that dress until Jenny walked up the aisle. He didn't pay for the dress. He didn't make the dress. He didn't shop for the dress. It wasn't his idea, his thoughts, oh, she looked really nice in that. It, he had nothing to do with what Jenny wore on that day. Now think about our life as Christians. We're the bride. Jesus is the bridegroom. Who prepares the dress? 
And we're sat here, so many people thinking that Jesus is preparing this white, beautiful robe. And when we die, somehow we're going to be transformed into a completely different person. And we're going to be all there, glorious and fantastic, wearing this white dress. No, it, it says, the bride has made herself ready. Now, imagine that you get to the wedding dressing room and to your horror... You know, you go for the case where the wedding dress should be and you thought that your husband was doing it and he thought you were doing it and you open the case and there's nothing there. And it's the most high-profile wedding in the whole of the history of, of the universe with every great person that has ever lived and all the angels, everyone, God himself, everyone watching to see who has Jesus chosen to marry? What will you look like on that day? The bride invests a great deal of time and money into that dress to make sure that she looks as beautiful as she can, as attractive as she can to her husband, and as fine a woman as she can to the guests. You know, that the husband is marrying an appropriate woman. She invests so much time and thought and love and care and preparation into her dress. And yet as Christians, we just think we're going to rock up and it's all going to be fine. You know, the husband's preparing my dress. Not a chance. And Jesus gives two parables where he talks about guests at a wedding who thought they were going to the wedding and then they weren't allowed in. Five foolish virgins started off well they had their oil and then in the end they were thrown into outer darkness they had the holy spirit they had their invitation they were there at the gate but because they didn't live right and then there was another one i won't go through that matthew 22 you can look at that later two parables jesus goes people that thought they were going to be the bride at the wedding and they were actually thrown out The fine linen represents the righteous deeds of God's people. Now, if you haven't lived for Jesus on this earth, then don't expect that you'll be given fine linen on that day. Jesus is offering to give it to you. And it's up to us if we want to take it. Point seven, I'm running out of time, so I'll just really quickly go over this. What does Jesus want his bride to be like? And there are five main passages in scripture that talk about brides and how they should be. So point seven, eight, two Corinthians six talks about do not be unequally yoked. And it talks about how you should marry an unbeliever. Now we talk about that with our young people when they start dating non-Christians, don't we? But just think about Jesus. He wrote these words. Is he going to be unequally yoked when he takes you to be his partner? He doesn't want to be with unbelieving people that don't follow the word of God. In fact, he commands, he says, no, you mustn't yoke yourself with people like that. Now we have to make sure that he's not unequally yoked with us. Then 7b, the Song of Songs, it's one of my favourite books in the Bible. I've got a, one day I'll preach, I've got an eight-part series on that book. And that talks all about the, the passion that Jesus is looking for in his bride, the intimacy, the love. You know, it's a wonderful thing to be in love and to be passionate about your bride. Jesus, is, he didn't want a boring person that just goes to church, you know, sort of, half-heartedly sings the songs he, he wants passion he wants closeness he wants love and then the wife of noble character Proverbs 31 that's a, another passage and you look at that and she cares diligently for her family always making sure that her you know her children and those around her spiritual family the church whatever working day and night and it talks about her hard work. She gets up while it's still light, light night. 
Her lamp doesn't go out. She sets about her work vigorously. She doesn't eat the bread of idleness. You know, some Christians are so lazy. And you want volunteers to do something. It's really hard to get them, especially when it's outreach or prayer. Uh, you know, every, everyone wants to come forward and receive communion. And if we have a barbecue, it's full. But when it's like, who wants to come out and preach at the traveller camp? The gospel, you know, that every hand goes down. And um, we need to work hard for the Lord. Then, um, two, two more points there and point seven. I won't go through those, but you can look at them in the notes. Point seven, the last point about white clothes. White clothes signifies ministry. Now, we've touched on this a little bit. When we come to Jesus, he offers you the white robes of ministry. And I love the story of how God called Aaron and his sons to be priests. And we'll just finish thinking about this story because, do you know, Aaron, he was Moses' brother, and he'd grown up a slave in Egypt, and his sons were slaves. They were just the same as everybody else. They walked the same, they dressed the same, they ate the same, they did the same, they thought the same, they no difference. But then God brought them all out of Egypt, and Aaron, because he was Moses' brother, he helped Moses, so he had a bit of status. But then they came to Mount Sinai, and um, God spoke to the people that he wanted to live with them, and he wanted to encounter them, he wanted to meet them, so they had to make this tent, this tabernacle, that God would live there and uh, then certain people were going to be priests that would serve God. They'd do these offerings and only the priests could go very close to God. They'd listen to God and then they'd tell the other people what God was saying. And so, do you know, one day Aaron was just a normal guy in normal clothes and his sons were just normal guys playing with the other guys you know in the camp just the same as everybody else and then the next day God said to Aaron you I'm, I'm choosing you you're going to be my priest and Aaron's sons four sons he had you're going to be my priests and they must have looked at each other and, you know, looked at their friends and go, why me? I mean, what about him? He's, now I've chosen you, you're the priest. And then they made these amazing clothes, and, you know, woven with gold and purple and all the finest clothes, material that was available, turban, jewels to wear on the breastplate, stitched into the garments. And then they had to take seven days where just these five people, seven whole days where the whole assembly consecrated them. And there was a lot of killing of animals and covering them in blood, their lobes of their ears and their hands and their feet and their clothes. And they were basically covered top to toe in blood, you know, to be made holy. And these people who started off just the same as everybody else, God said, no, I'm choosing you. You look the same as them, you might feel the same, but I'm choosing you. And I have prepared these special clothes that are so beautiful, so precious. And I'm purifying you, I'm washing you in the blood. And then I'm going to give you the ministry. I'm calling you to stand before the people and talk about me. And you're to bring the people into my presence and you're to bring my presence to the people. You know, Aaron had four sons and two of his sons, within just a few days, they thought, oh, we're the priests of God. We're holy, we're wonderful. We can do whatever we want. And they offered incense presumptuously in a way that God hadn't asked them to do it and fire came from heaven and killed both of them and you know it's easy so many Christians live in presumption we think God I can do whatever I want you know I can go here do that whatever because God will just forgive me but we've thought this 
morning in many different ways. It doesn't work like that. You want your white clothes, you want your ministry. You have to live for God and, and follow God. And so this morning, God is offering those white clothes and he's saying, who will be for me a priest? I'll give you the clothes, I'll give you the outfit, all that you need, I'll give it to you. You have to buy off me, you have to invest your time, invest who you are, all that you are, you have to grow into that calling, but as you spend more time in that, you will grow and become what your clothes say that you are. You will be become a priest, and then you will carry me to these people. Who wants those white clothes that God is offering this morning? If you do, just, just close your eyes and we're going to say just a simple prayer. Lord, thank you that you shed your blood to wash me clean. All the stain, all the dirt, the guilt of my old life has been washed away. Lord, please wash it again because I've got my dress dirty. I've done so many wrong things, thought many wrong thoughts. Lord, forgive me. Wash me today again in the blood of Jesus. And Lord, I give you my life. Please give me those white robes. Let me live for you. Let me put on all this virtues, love and patience, gentleness. And Lord, let me be your servant. I give you my life. Let me work hard for you. So that on that last day, I won't be found naked in your sight. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, if you feel God's been speaking to you and you'd like prayer for that, feel free to come up and myself or Paul or one of the other leaders would be happy to pray for you. Otherwise, that's the official end of the, the meeting. Of, uh, we'll have tea and coffee. Enjoy each other's company. Thank you.